and welcome to the Future Interview podcast, where we talk with leaders in tech, science, and business about the future of technology and its impact on society and the global economy. I'm your host, Barrett Anderson, the COO of Future in Review, which The Economist has called the best technology conference in the world. And I'm here today with Paul McLaren, who is the co-founder and CTO of STRID. Paul, welcome. It is so great to have you here with us today. Thank you. Glad to join you today. Looking forward to this. So STRID has been selected as a 2023 Firestarter company. And we're going to talk a little bit more about what you do in a second. For those who are not familiar with our Firestarter program, these are companies that are generally startup companies that are using technology to change the world for the better in some way or to solve some. And STRID specifically is using DNA immutability and blockchain to establish a lifetime ID, which securely links an individual's physical identity to their digital presence and assets. So, Paul, I'm hoping that you can start off by telling me a little bit more about why did you create this product? What, what is the need for this? Like, why do we need a DNA linked ID? Sure. So, you know, if you look at the news all these days, the IDs are getting hacked and identities stolen and credit cards stolen. And mix that with my background working in forensic DNA, where we had a large amount of call for people's DNA into disasters. Mm -hmm. Fires out in California was one of the big ones that we had to work for many times, but hurricanes in different parts of the world. So we had this idea that most of the IDs that we use today in our wallet are of some random number, and it's generated by the company or the government in a big central database, and it has this ability to get stolen. Okay. Same time, we are moving into a world where everything is logging in on the computer, bank accounts, everything I do, I'm using an ID of some sort. So we had the idea that we could combine the work and the past that we've done with DNA research into an ID. As just your DNA doesn't change. It's a set combination that's with you for your entire life and never is uh, changed. It's not alterable. You could always prove who you are. So we thought, what a basis for an ID that rather than being some random number was actually based on who I am as a physical person. And that's that bridge between my physical being and my presence online. And even primary biometric identification systems that are in use today, we've got face ID on iPhones, we've got fingerprint IDs all over the place. But those things also can change over a person's lifetime, right? They certainly can. And all the good systems actually watch for that. You use your iPhone. Every time you log with your face, it looks for slight differences and things that change. But if you think of all of those systems, they basically take a physical feature, mm -hmm. which, as you said, does change over time, but it encodes it into a string of numbers that really have no inherent meaning. So if you were to look at the numbers behind a fingerprint, it doesn't mean anything to anyone. Right. Or, but the DNA, that string of numbers it is your genetic code. And that is something that can be used to restore your identification, to identify you in the amount of a disaster. Or if I needed to get access back to my bank account quickly, the DNA tests these days are under two hours. I can do a quick test to unrefutably prove who I am and get restore access into my uh, accounts and systems. So you have a background in DNA research, it sounds like. What are the kind of concerns that as you were developing STRID or either security concerns or personal data concerns, what that you designed for? Because I think there are a lot of people who may be a little hesitant to use, link their DNA to things. <laughs> How did you think about that in, in building out this product and what decisions did you make as a result? Uh, yes, certainly was one of our key tenets as we went into this. And yeah, you hear it all the time. Your DNA is undisputably the best method to use for identifying people in courts and things. But there's an awful lot of social pushback about collecting the DNA. Though we're seeing that trend change quite a bit with all the ancestry and one, two, three, me, all these genetic tools that people can use these days, more and more Americans particularly are getting their DNA taken and sending it into these places. At the same time, you're hearing the stories about that these 
DNA places are starting to share some of this information right. off. Or of they're it. acquired and then someone else they're acquired or they're hacked or else yeah. they hacked. Yeah. So we are moving in the the direction that uh, much of the world is looking to move. And what's called self-sovereign means that rather than sending your DNA and having it in some big database, you have complete control over your data and your DNA. Sure. So as a company, STRID, we and really... that's the blockchain technology. Some of it's blockchain. Some of it's our patented process of encrypting the data. Okay. You take a DNA very similar to what you do for one of these home DNA tests or mm -hmm. your uh, gene genealogy. You send it into the lab. The difference is our kit has no identifying information of you, an individual. So your DNA is there and you'll have a encryption key that you provide. You're the only one that has that and it gets sent to the lab and there'll be a kit code. And that code is what links for us, you to our database. Got it. So it's like a, a third party blind system. When it gets into the lab, they run your DNA and come up with that chain. And they then at the lab encrypt it using the encryption key that you provided. It then gets sent to us, but when it's sent to us, it's already encrypted. So we have no access to it. The only one that has that encryption key is you and the lab. And our contracts with the lab is if once they send it out, it's destroyed. So they no longer have access to it. But the lab never have any of your personal information. So all they have is the DNA and an encryption key. They have no name or address or anything else. That is only linked in the database by you with your encryption key. So STRID never has access to your DNA. Hmm. So it gives you as an individual that control over the data. And it's not just DNA. We also have to put in other important documents for your ID if you wish. But that gives you complete control and what we call the trust circle is that you can identify trusted loved ones, spouses, family members that can decrypt if necessary. So if there's a disaster and they need to get your DNA to law enforcement quickly, they are able to do that. But we as a company never have access to it. So in this, as a user, if I were to become a, a member of STRID, am I getting that phraseology correct? Yes, that's what we call our okay. member. That's a member, yes. So I become a member. I send in my DNA. How are you seeing people mostly use this genetic encryption ID, encrypted genetic ID? <laughs> so again, there's two facets to it. One is identifying who you are definitively. Mm -hmm. So as we move into more and more of these financial uh, transactions, especially things like the Bitcoin that are completely online, mm -hmm. there is a lot of these transactions that are hacked and things are stolen. So using attaching an STRID to this transaction basically attaches your encrypted DNA to it, which is completely unique to you. So if there is some question about, or if you need to go back to the bank and say that, hey, this is mine, right. it's my transaction, they can look at that embedded STR ID and know that it's you. And so I you know, could use it, for example, to secure uh, some kind of Bitcoin wallet. Yes. Yeah. I mean, that, that's an area where a lot of people lost a lot of money, right? With their... Certainly is. <laughs> so that is yet yeah, one. They of... forgot their password. Yes. Or if you needed to, to, to transfer a large amount of money in your bank, mm -hmm. they may request to secure it in a, a better fashion than just using your fingerprint. And, and then, something on top of that. And then at the same time, for example, if I were to do that to secure my financial assets and then I was killed in a car accident or caught in a, 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 an intense storm or something, I could then provide my family the ability to access my accounts in the case of death or Cor other. Correct. And, and part of this also is that you know, look at some of the fires we've had out in, in California recently where there was quite a few people, unfortunately, burned beyond recognition or in Hawaii, mm -hmm. you know, these types of things. The process for law enforcement to try to determine who was burned, who was died and, and get answers back to the family. Unfortunately, it's not always the best answer, but closure is very important. This gives the family the ability to very quickly release to law enforcement your DNA that then they can match. 
Their other, only other option is to have law enforcement try to come to a family member's house or location and get DNA from personal effects left behind or take plant swabs from family members, which can be very traumatic for the family and time consuming for law enforcement. It's an interesting, I don't think most people don't have to think about this problem until it's really a problem, right? At, at, which, at which point you really don't want to think about it. And, and so I think, I feel like your, this, your approach to this is, is something that um, most, the average person would rather not consider, but you're basically giving them the, the ability to not have to consider it too much. Right. You're giving them the ability to to make that those choices and those really hard decisions a little bit easier. And that's the idea. Try to get people to plan ahead a little bit so that it is not having to be done under the worst possible circumstances, whether that's a disaster or natural or a financial disaster. To have these pieces, parts in place ahead of time and e easily accessible takes a lot of the stress off the individual and the family. So tell me where you are as a company. Like, what is your current business model for this technology? Do you see this change? Do you see that changing over time? And how are you thinking about the business planning part of this? So uh, our philosophy with our company really is that we are enabling to net technology for other companies that do ID. So we're not mm -hmm. out there trying to compete with every other ID company. We're trying to say that you can add our STR ID and QR code is a quick way that we use for I, for uh, representing your DNA genetic ID, the encrypted version, of course. Mm -hmm. But that is an enabler for other things. So on, like I said, bank transactions that could be put onto that, on the important documents, mortgage deed that could be put onto that, bonds or something that you wanted to have identified as you that could be put onto that. Things such as a membership card for an airline or a hotel for somebody who's traveling all the time. STR ID could be added to that so that if they're somewhere and God forbid, there's a uh, aircraft disaster or a natural disaster somewhere, they would already have basically logged in when they use that card and said that they are there and their DNA is on file. And if I'm, let's say I'm a customer, a member, and... I want to access my data, do I have to provide a DNA sample or the encryption code? Are there, is it one or the other? So you, at the start of this, become a member, mm -hmm. you do provide a sample of your DNA and your encryption. code, And then after that, you can access your DNA string and look at it, print it out, show it to somebody, email it using your login information. So your encryption code, basically, you decrypt yeah, right. it, you see it. So that is a kind of a step that is mandated in our system to decrypt that DNA from the encrypted one. And that's the encrypted one is what we use for the actual ID because it's still unique to you. But to actually get to your genetic string, you can go in and just check a box and confirm that you want to decrypt it. And there'll be your DNA string for everyone to see or whoever you would like to share it. So it sounds like you're primarily focused at the moment on partnerships with financial institutions or other. Yeah, and that's what we're seeing. Our biggest, our immediate thrust is the, the financial institutions. We've also looked at many things, as I said, membership cards, credit cards, college IDs. There's mm -hmm. lots of different places we're working. But right now, there's it's such a, a large loss in the financial industry from accounts that are hacked or transactions right. that are misdirected. And we hear the horror stories all the time of somebody who has their ID stolen and then cannot access their funds for months sometimes as they get together all the required documents and try to prove who they are. As opposed to what we're proposing is that two hours, I can definitively prove who I am with DNA. What impact do you see this having, if any, on international money laundering? So again, um, you know, many of this is done through chant back channels or black right. market. All right. It's not in the, the forefront of the thing, but all of these transactions that are moved across, they are used with false IDs, right? 
or you shell know, companies, shell, shell or, companies yeah. or multiple, but some mm-hmm. way of setting up something that's not, the money is not truly linked to the individual. Mm-hmm. So uh, one of our proposals, and we've talked to several financial institutions about it, is that there is some threshold of transaction that the bank would start requiring that they use a STRID to confirm that transaction. And this is not something that I can just grab the DNA and fake, right? So, so that is why STRID is so powerful. It's my DNA. Nobody else can have it. Nobody else can copy it. I can't hack it or fake it. So it, it can start to make these transactions much more secure and traceable because it comes right back to the my STRI ID and my immutable DNA. Do you foresee? Okay, so let's think about the future for a second. Sure. Let's say 10 years from now, you've got all of these banks are using STRID to track financial transactions all over the world. Have you thought about what would happen? What happens when law enforcement approaches you and says, here is the STRID of this person that the bank has just given us because they're under investigation? Who are they? So that's one of our core tenets. We, our model is self-sovereignty. And I explained a little bit earlier, but just to repeat what that is, as a company, STRID never has your raw DNA. Mm -hmm. So if law enforcement came to us, even with a subpoena and said, who is this person? There's not, we can't tell them. We don't have that information because it is truly a self-sovereign system. The only one that has access to that raw data is you and whoever you identify in your trust circle. So that's, as a company, that's a very nice position to be in, that we can't be hacked, or we don't have the concerns about law enforcement coming and getting into the databases that many people have evidence that they don't want to give their DNA specifically for that reason. Yeah. This is all very interesting. I look forward to talking more about this at Future in Review. Are there, as a company, are there things that you are particularly, you're, you're particularly looking for at the moment? What are your priorities and how can the Future in Review audience support you if desired? So really one of the biggest things we're looking for right now is exposure. And this mm-hmm. really is a new idea, something that nobody else has done before. We have filed a patent on it, but it, it's a new idea and people are always looking for the, the better biometric fingerprints, as you say, and face recognition. It's a slightly different place, but the idea to tie my particular DNA that I can use as a baby born in the hospital to create my very first ID and continue to use throughout my life and after death, even if necessary, and it never changes. So really what we're looking for is people to understand this concept of a new way of doing an ID, a self-sovereign ID. That is not a big company with a central database of all this information and really giving the the power to the people to control their own destiny and how they want to represent themselves in our big digital world these days. Yeah, that's very well put. I feel like a lot of there's a lot of concern about and who, okay, if I do this, who's going to have access to my stuff, right? If you're thinking about there's so many different kinds of personal data. And a lot of the models that we have in the ecosystem today are models where actually Apple knows everything about you and Facebook (laughs) Meta knows everything about you and their policies are the only thing that are standing in the way or providing access to all that data. But you are a very unique company for because you're actually the opposite of that. Exactly. And as much as you credit companies for having good policies where they can, you see the stories every week, some database is getting hacked, best intentions, but that doesn't, when you have a large centralized database that just opens it up for hackers and disgruntled employees and others to try to get hold of that Or data. pressure from authoritarian governments or whatever it might be. Exactly. And we have taken the exactly opposite track to that, that we don't want the data we, and we refuse to have it. It's your data. You're going to keep it. Paul, thank you very much for your work on this front. I look forward to seeing you and meeting you in person in L.A. in just a few weeks. And if you are coming to, as a viewer of this podcast, if you are coming to Future Interview, you too can hang out with Paul and I at the Terranea Resort. 
very much looking forward to it. And thank you. It's been great to talk with you today. Thank you. You too.